I'm very happy to see uh, such a large number of uh, registered participants to the webinar from all over Europe, but then even wider. I see uh, many colleagues from Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, so on. So uh, warm regards to um, every, every single participant. Um, the final webinar of 2019 will explore the topic of uh, how to prepare a good self-assessment report for ANQA agency review. But then also we will use some time to reflect on the value of the process for the agency's development. Um, now, allow me to um, very briefly elaborate on um, why this um, webinar. Uh, we have received at the ANQA Secretariat um, many requests to... Um, to elaborate or, or better said, to, to present on how to prepare um, well for the self-assessment and how to uh, submit a good self-assessment report for, for the review um, that um, the agencies uh, will be uh, preparing for in the upcoming uh, years. And then secondly, um, we would like to use the opportunity to discuss on how to take most out of, of, the, out of the process of self-assessment as um, we see that the review, that the self-assessment report as such should not be uh, a sole goal of, uh, of, um, of the review. Um, so uh, we will use this webinar to reflect on this part as well. Um, now, uh, I have to say that um, this webinar is not on how to um, start the process of ANCA agency review, uh, but uh, to focus on how to prepare a good self-assessment report. If you have any question about how to start the, um, the review process uh, with ANCA uh, coordinating your review, your agency's review, then uh, please write me an email and then we can further discuss on these matters. Uh, we have two speakers with us uh, um, today. Um, I'm very happy to um, say hi to Fiona Crozier, independent consultant and former head of, in uh, of international from QAA uh, UK and Asnate uh, Kajoka. Uh, she's uh, uh, an expert, a project expert from Academic Information Center from Latvia. Uh, um, hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. Uh, Fiona will elaborate more generally on the value of the self assessment process for the agency's development, whereas Asnate uh, is here with us uh, to share her or her agency's. Um, uh, experience on preparing a good self-assessment report for uh, an NK agency review. They have un undergone a review um, a year ago, so very fresh experience in this regard. Um, now, just a couple of words about Fiona and Asnate before we start. Fiona has worked for um, in higher education for over 25 years. She has extensive experience in quality assurance, more uh, specifically, she focuses on the development, implementation, and operationalization of uh, internal and external quality assurance methods, uh, training of peer reviews, um, but she's also our uh, expert uh, in the expert pool for uh, agency reviews, chairing uh, and uh, participating in the panels of uh, many of our, uh, our reviews in the last years. Um, she was also a, a um, she was a vice president in the ANCA board from 2019 to 2013, um, and her most uh, recent post was as head of international, like I said, uh, at the QAA, and she's currently working as an independent uh, consultant. Um, as, uh, now about Asnate, very briefly uh, as well, very um, uh, highly experienced in the quality assurance field. Uh, with the positions in the, in the administration of the University of Latvia. Uh, Asnate is as well um, uh, an expert um, uh, and the secretary uh, in anchor agency reviews. Um, she uh, cooperates with the Latvian Council of Higher Education and the State Education Development Agency. Um, since 2015, she has worked for the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education, uh, helping setting it up, and then also uh, helping uh, the agency undergo uh, the uh, external review against uh, the ESG 2015. Uh, now, just before I give uh, my word to Fiona, uh, let me emphasize that this webinar is recorded, so you can find the recording of the webinar on uh, ANCA's uh, YouTube profile. 
Um, and you will be able to find all the slides that we will uh, show you today on our uh, website. I will send you all uh, a link to, to this uh, website after the webinar. Um, you are uh, welcome to raise questions in the chat function. I see that you are already um, using it uh, nicely, so um, keep keep doing so. Um, so there's nothing else to say from my side than to invite Fiona for the first part of the of the presentation of the webinar. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Goran. Um, I think my slide, yeah, my slides are there. Um, thank you and good afternoon to everyone. It's really nice to see what a global webinar this is. I'm just looking at the, the chat function down the side and it truly is worldwide. So um, good afternoon to you from a very cold but sunny United Kingdom. Um, thank you to Enqua as well for inviting me to do this. Uh, it is perhaps hard to think about the value or the benefits of a self-assessment report when you're right at the start of a, a review process. Um, it's just the, the job in hand that you're thinking about at that point. But I'm hopefully going to try and give some examples from QAA's perspective of how we did find the self-assessment process to be beneficial. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I think as Nati might talk a bit more about that. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the benefits of the self-assessment process for four groups of people. Um, and the focus of the value of a recently written self-assessment report, which should be the outcome um, of your labour. OK, so the first group of people that I want to talk about are the staff of the agency. Um, and I, I talk from our perspective and I realise that this might differ depending on the size of your agency. Um, if you've got a very small agency or a very large agency, what I say might differ, but I hope that the principles are the same. Um, certainly, the, the first thing that we found to be valuable was involving as many people as you can. And how you do that will be up to you. Um, we, we did it through a project group and through the SWOT analysis, but that would be entirely up to the agency. But I think the key point to remember is that the European standards and guidelines themselves, that th those standards that we have to comply with, they're really broad. And they range from, for example, finance through to review methodologies. So to have one person or even one or two people writing the self-assessment, really, it doesn't make sense. Um, it makes sense to involve as many of the, those people with their expertise as possible. I think the SAR will be better. The self-assessment will be better the wider the involvement of the staff. And I think if the staff can then see their contributions fed back to them when they read that self-assessment that can be truly culture changing it can help to break down silos where you have people from finance where you actually i think we had someone from finance and we actually realized that they had some great ideas about how reviews were operating but they never said anything because they worked in the finance department but mm -hmm. they came along to one of the meetings spoke up and it was a different perspective for us and it helped to break down some of the barriers that sometimes you know, we think, well, we work in that department. The people who do all the accounts and things, they work over there. Uh, those other people in marketing, they work over there. And it helped to break down some of those barriers for us. And it also helps um, if there is ownership of that self-assessment. And if you've got broad participation and involvement, being able to read the document afterwards and see some of your contributions, that helps to develop ownership. And that, I would suggest, is key for when the review panel actually comes along to visit, um, because a review panel, panel can very quickly tell whether there is agency-wide ownership of the self-assessment report. So that's the first group of people that I'd like to suggest are, are the, the self-assessment report is of value to them. The second group, oh, yeah, the second group are your external stakeholders. And this can be a really broad range of people. I mean, what I've put here is not exhaustive by any means, but you've got expert panel members or reviewers. You've got representative bodies, for example, for us in the United Kingdom, it's Universities UK, funding councils and so on. We have ministries, students, employers, and for QAA, external members of our own board who come from outside of higher education. Bringing them on board and asking them to participate in some way or another 
in the review process through the self-assessment report was really valuable for us. Um, their perspective is different. Uh, they asked different questions that for in our part, they read a draft, quite a, quite a developed draft. But the comments that they sent back and the questions that they asked were invaluable because we thought we'd explained things, but actually reading the comments from some of these people from outside the agency, it was quite clear that they hadn't understood what it was that we were trying to say. So actually bringing them on board was really valuable for us, but I think it's also valuable for them. They did appreciate being asked, even if they didn't comment or felt that they didn't have anything specific that they wanted to say. They wrote to us and told us how interested they were to read the draft um, because it helps to change their perception of the agency. Some of the problems that the agency is working with might become more evident to your external stakeholders if they can read a self-assessment report. And some of the things that you think you're doing really well are also clearer to those stakeholders. I think sometimes agencies assume that everybody knows what it is that we're doing or why we do things in a particular way. But it's quite often not the case for those who sit outside our immediate sphere of work. And for them, I think they find that really, really useful. We certainly did in terms of finalising the self-assessment report and changing how we had explained certain things. The third group is the agency itself, not just the staff, but the agency as an entity. Uh, and we all are very good at telling institutions that, you know, a good self-assessment report is one that's evaluative and self-critical and so on. Well, it's exactly the same for the agencies. Um, this process for the agency as a whole and its management and its senior, its senior layer, it's providing opportunities for staff to engage and to learn about the agency itself. And I talked already about that sort of cross fertilization, learning about different parts of the agency. It provided us with this opportunity to engage at a deeper level with our stakeholders, as I've said. But what it also then provided us with in a very concrete way was a document that was as accurate as we could make it and as reflective as we could make it. And that's a snapshot in time. So it is just a snapshot in time. But at that point in time, we realized what a valuable document this was for induction uh, for different levels. So some of our board members told us that actually they wished they'd been given that document when they began their, their period of time as board members for QAA. New members of staff, our personnel HR department, took the self-assessment report and they kind of, it was there as a whole document, but it was pretty long. So I think any new member of staff who could get through 48, 50 pages plus annexes would be a very dedicated person. But nonetheless, HR was able to take sections of that and use it in the induction process for new members of staff because this point in time when you're being not forced, but you're having to sit down and really think about what it is you do, how you do it, why you do it, why you do it like that, and how you make things better. It only happens once in a while. It should happen more often, perhaps, but it happens at this particular point. And it's a really good opportunity to explain to others, new staff and so on, how you work. In some respects, I would say that it's almost more valuable than the review itself. And I have heard institutions tell us at QAA that the self-assessment report writing was the most valuable part of the process. But I do know that um, the review leads to hopefully ENQA membership and registration on ECWAR. So we can't really say that this is the most valuable bit of the review, but I would suggest that it is one of the most valuable parts of a review process. The final group that I want to talk about are the review panel. Uh, and I don't think you can underestimate the value of an open and honest, self-critical self-assessment report. Review panels don't have a lot of time. If they have to spend a lot of time trying to get behind the words of the self-assessment, trying to find out, is it accurate? What does the agency think about that? Um, and if they have to waste time trying to get behind what's what's there and try to understand things, it limits their time to do the actual job that they're there for. 
if the self-assessment report is written in a way that allows the panel to get behind the description and to start to get a real feel for the agency, it is going to help the panel to do its job. And its job is to confirm your good practice that you might highlight or that we might highlight to them. It's to help them make useful and relevant recommendations so that they're not making recommendations about things because they've actually misunderstood or they've not quite understood what's written. And it also is going to help them come to sound evidence-based judgments so that that means that when that report goes before the ENQA board, it's going to be easier for decisions to be taken overall. Finally, I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm making it all sound like it's, it's, it's a sort of a heavenly process. It certainly isn't. Um, <laughs> it's hard work. It's 12 to 18 months of hard work and redrafting and people then saying, oh, well, I don't understand that paragraph. And, and at the time you're thinking that is not helpful. Now we're going to have to write it again. It's really hard work. It did make it better for us at QAA when stakeholders and staff began to comment on how useful they were finding the process. They were pleased to be involved. They were pleased to be asked to comment. And the final document was something that they were happy with and that they felt was useful. And that helped us. It, we had a long period of time developing the SAR before we sent it out for comment. Uh, when you're a little bit in the dark, but when you get some feedback, even if it's hard to take it on board, it is really helpful and it does make it feel like a, a more useful process. I can't comment on every case, but our review went well. So I think my final slide, if I can get to it, to those of you who are going review, through review imminently, I'm going to say good luck and I hope that the self-assessment report process is a good one for you. Thank you, Goran. Thank you, Fiona. For, um most of all for going so nicely and so clearly through the target groups, but then again for raising uh, so many uh, valuable points that we will uh, further elaborate on uh, during this webinar, um, I'm sure. Um, Asnate, um, the word is yours. How, how was the experience uh, from, from AIC? Uh, how did you see the process? Hello. Um, I will share my own and my agency's experience about how we went through the anchor review uh, and also try to give you some tips on uh, how to uh, succeed better than we did and what to take into account when doing it. Uh, so first of all, uh, the outline of my presentation, uh, I will talk about the national context in Latvia, which was crucial um, to understand uh, the way how we um, did the self validation process and why it was the way it was. Uh, then about the process uh, itself, and in our case, uh, the main aim of the process was not to prepare the report. It uh, must be noted that the process itself was much broader than only the report for ENCRA. Uh, then about uh, the report, how we wrote it. Then uh, I was asked to talk also about uh, uh, the stages where ENCRA is involved, uh, how the review was uh, perceived by ENCRA, and what were the requests um, by the review panel and also about the lessons learned from the whole process. Uh, so to start with, uh, Latvia is um, a quite small country, uh, but the QA traditions um, are rather uh, early, and uh, the first agency was in fact established in the early 1990s. It was one of the very first uh, in Europe. Uh, it uh, was quite successful for uh, more than 10 years, in fact, almost 20 years, uh, but it was closed down uh, following an unsuccessful anchor review. Uh, and uh, the process between uh, this first agency and the establishment of uh, ICA or the new agency uh, was uh, quite stressful because uh, uh, one of the main aims was to uh, get rid of all the uh, legal constraints and all the factors that led to the unsuccessful review of the first agency um, and to make sure that uh, the new one will be successful and uh, will operate uh, internationally and will follow the international standards. Uh, so uh, the timeline of the uh, review for AIC or ICA uh, was the following. Uh, in fact, uh, this operation uh, process started in uh, the end of uh, 2014 
uh, when the decision about establishing a new QA agency, which was not uh, the ministry, so an independent one, uh, was made uh, back then. Uh, and then the, uh, the work started. And in July 2015, uh, the ICA uh, was uh, opened and started to operate. Uh, we had a completely uh, new legal framework designed for the new agency. Uh, we had uh, um, a new office, uh, new staff members, and uh, uh, a new area to operate. Uh, and then uh, one of the first tasks uh, was for us uh, to establish a timeline uh, for being fully recognized uh, internationally. Uh, which would mean uh, being a full member of ENQA and listed on ECWA. And then uh, uh, two years between uh, 2015 and August uh, 2017 uh, were in fact devoted to different uh, um, work related to uh, establishing legal framework, establishing guidelines, um, establishing internal procedures, and making it all work. And then you can see that the following uh, steps were already related to the anchor review uh, and the uh, preparation of the report. And uh, what was, in, uh, what was uh, complicated and a bit demanding in our case was that we tried to um, become full members of ENQA at the very earliest possibility. Uh, so we had uh, operated for uh, not full two years when we already uh, made the self relation report and tried to apply for membership. Uh, then here is the report. You can access it on our web page and see how it looks. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the process of self relation uh, was not only aimed at the preparation of the report, there were many catalysts which were, were crucial uh, when starting it. At first, the, the historical issues with the former agency, uh, we were in fact quite cautious about uh, reviews and being reviewed because at the moment when uh, ICA started to operate, uh, there were still some issues which were not solved at the national level and we were trying to solve them. And we were afraid that we might not be able to solve them before the review. Uh, also, um, one of the catalysts was uh, political will to establish a new agency, which would be a member of ANQA. But I know that in many countries, uh, discussions with the policymakers are demanding and it's complicated to agree on something. In our case, there was a will to establish a new agency which would be compliant with the ESG. Uh, so it helped us a lot. Also, we had a very uh, strong participation of stakeholders, uh, students, uh, universities, uh, trade unions, uh, employers who were also very, uh, all very active and uh, tried to help us and to take part in all the processes, uh, both on the national level, but uh, drafting the framework and also in the everyday activities of the agency. Uh, one more catalyst was uh, the new SGs. Because in fact, uh, uh, ICA was established at the same time when the new SGs were drafted and published. Uh, so we took the chance to design our processes in line with the new SGs uh, even before the SGs were published. Um, because sometimes it's easier to do something from the very beginning and not to align it with something that has been existing before. So in our case, uh, we had the chance to take the new SGs and to align uh, the way how we will work with the new SGs. And also we had the funding uh, for becoming an uh, ECHA registered agency, which was uh, assigned to us with the same. And then uh, the process of self evaluation started uh, even before the agency itself was established. Uh, we evaluated the current state of art in uh, Latvia. Uh, we identified what was not working well in the previous systems, what should be done, 
and try to, to do as much as possible. Uh, all this process was very open and critical. We were not afraid of our mistakes and weak sides. We tried to identify them as much as possible and to solve them. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, input from uh, different stakeholders, students, employers, uh, universities, trade unions, ministries. And uh, we all took, uh, together developed uh, the new policy documents on the national level, uh, the uh, internal guidelines of the agency. We had a lot of working groups, consultations, seminars, trainings for different stakeholders. Uh, the process itself was led by the agency staff, but uh, we were not uh, in a restricted position. We were very open to all the input from uh, different stakeholders and tried to support them and uh, to make them feel open to express what they think and what should be done. Also, what uh, helped a lot was uh, our consultations with uh, our colleagues from different countries. Uh, we uh, went on uh, exchange visits to many colleagues and also colleagues visited us for seminars and for exchange visits. Uh, we were quite open about what we're doing and about our challenges and tried to ask questions and to solve them together with uh, our colleagues. What we faced in this phase uh, was a different uh, interpretation of the ESGs because uh, there are very many uh, ideas and uh, understandings of how to interpret different standards. And also different agencies have faced uh, the comments from different panels. Uh, so at some uh, point, we were quite confused about what should we do and how should we act to be compliant with the ESGs. Uh, but uh, all in all, we uh, uh, made our own way and uh, took all the uh, Good advice and uh, establish our uh, own way how to work according to the ESGs. And then uh, the process uh, still continued, and uh, the report was only uh, one of the outcomes of the process itself. And for the report, we uh, established a group of uh, four persons from the agency. Uh, we're um, in charge of uh, preparing the report and uh, aligning it with the uh, requested uh, sections. But uh, all staff members took part in uh, writing the report. Uh, we had divided uh, different sections by different uh, responsibilities. For example, uh, the person who was in charge of finance, I wrote this part about the uh, finance. We had the person who was in charge of the public databases, and she wrote this part. And then uh, all members were somehow involved in writing, either a part of uh, the report or uh, commenting on what has been done by other colleagues. Uh, we followed uh, the guidelines uh, by NCLA very closely. Uh, and uh, during the review, we understood that uh, it helped a lot uh, to avoid uh, additional workload later, because if you start from the beginning and follow the guidelines from the very beginning, uh, you will not be asked to provide additional information which could have been provided before. Uh, what we also did, uh, we discussed uh, uh, the progress of the report uh, in different meetings, both uh, internally with the staff and also externally with uh, our decision-making body and our council. And when we discussed uh, the progress, we uh, asked for feedback and tried to uh, include it in uh, the final report. Uh, then uh, we sent uh, the report to ENCA. Uh, we were not very sure about uh, how it will be perceived because we thought that we had followed all the guidelines, uh, but we were not sure about uh, the uh, wording and uh, is it clear enough? Is it detailed enough? And in fact, we waited for quite a lot of comments from Enqua, but there were not that many comments. Uh, most of the comments were about uh, the way how something was expressed, 
and not about the content itself. For example, uh, there were some terms that we had used in the report uh, which were not consistent throughout the report. And we were asked to align all the uh, terms, for example, the titles of different commissions, uh, of different um, uh, consultative bodies, uh, to be uh, aligned and in the same way. And also in some cases, uh, uh, it was uh, we had uh, expressed something in a way that we thought it's clear, but uh, we realized that uh, it was not clear for an external person. So we had to rewrite some parts uh, to make them understandable for uh, anyone from outside. And then uh, uh, when uh, the report was transferred to the experts, uh, we had some more requests. Uh, we were asked uh, quite many documents by the experts, and we were quite uh, frightened about the amount of the documents. Uh, because we thought that uh, if there are so many questions, then it must be all were really bad and we uh, will probably not succeed with the review. It was not that intent. And uh, in fact, uh, it was also one of the lessons learned that uh, the amount of information requested by the experts does not necessarily mean that something is bad. Uh, it might mean that something is not clear enough, but not necessarily bad. Uh, we were asked to different regulations, which were initially only in Latvian and were not translated to uh, English. We were also asked about uh, connections between different bodies and different uh, stakeholders, which were not uh, described in a very detailed way in the report. And we were asked of, uh, about translations of some documents. And the most of the requests were not about additional uh, facts or evidence that were about uh, the way how something was presented in the report. Uh, and uh, in fact, the most demanding part of the whole additional information process was the translation part, not the information itself. In our case, uh, we did not have a person who would uh, uh, know the uh, local language, but uh, it is one of the requirements for a panel which is now uh, in force. Uh, so in our case, we had to do a bit more with the translation part. But normally, uh, there would be one person who would know the local language, uh, so the translation part would not be so extensive, and uh, it would be easier to provide this additional information. And then about the lessons learned. Uh, what we learned uh, was that uh, it is crucial to involve stakeholders from the very beginning. Because during the uh, expert's visit, uh, we were praised for um, our stakeholders being very active. And uh, in fact, it was that of the fact that it, uh, they were involved in uh, all our processes from the very beginning. And they were able to uh, comment on every point that the experts would raise. And they were knowledgeable about uh, our, um, all our documents, processes, procedures. Um, the agency structures, etc. Uh, so, in order to uh, get full support from uh, stakeholders and to be able to operate the way uh, we'd like to, it is important to involve stakeholders from the very beginning and to ask for their advice because they will be the ones who will uh, support you later, uh, both during the interview and also in the future with our stakeholders and uh, on the national level. Uh, level. Uh, also, what we learned is that it is easier to design something from the very beginning than to adjust something. Uh, we were lucky to design everything from the very beginning, and there were only very few things that had to be transferred from the previous systems. But I know that it's very hard to uh, change something that has existed for a while, and it is sometimes easier to make something new. Uh, also, what we learned is that uh, uh, if the team who writes the report is small, it is uh, better, but still all staff members have to be involved. Uh, in our case, we had only around 10 staff members at the time of the review. So four of them were in charge of the report, and the other six were involved in uh, drafting the report. And it's also in, uh, important to discuss with uh, other colleagues 
um, the progress and to share what has uh, been done. To make them involved and to make them feel uh, the ownership of, of the report and of the process. Uh, then it is crucial to follow the guidelines because uh, if you do not follow the guidelines from the very beginning, uh, there might be a lot of extra work uh, later. Uh, we faced it only to a very small extent because we had to write only uh, one section that was missing from the very beginning, but uh, you should follow the guidelines uh, uh, as closely as possible because uh, it will reduce the workload you have to do uh, later. Uh, also about the, the content of the report, it uh, must be analytical and evaluate the situation and not describe it. Uh, in our case, we were sometimes even too critical because when we look at examples from other colleagues, uh, we saw that the same case that we had described as critical uh, uh, was uh, described in a very positive way. And uh, we had, uh, in a way, served us in a bad way uh, by uh, criticizing ourselves. So you should uh, uh, be fair and critical, but not overly critical, because uh, you have to give credit to yourself for the things that are done well. And uh, the panel and the readers of the report will uh, evaluate it. Uh, also, what we uh, did was that we wrote, uh, wrote a report in English from the very beginning and did not use translator. Uh, we learned from some colleagues who had written uh, the reports in uh, their local language, but that the translation afterwards was not uh, correct and fair, and they had to put a lot of effort uh, to rewrite the report in a proper English, which would uh, express what they had meant before. So if, if it is possible, uh, we would uh, uh, suggest you to use English from the very beginning and to try to express yourselves in English. Uh, then uh, you must be very careful about uh, the language of the report because you have to understand that the people who will read it uh, might not be familiar with your system and might uh, not know uh, everything that you have written there. Uh, so when using the terms and describing structures, you should be careful about uh, the terms and about expressions that you use and to try to understand uh, how it will be read from external reader. Uh, then, as I mentioned before, the number of requests for the additional information uh, is not a bad sign itself. It only means that something has not, something has not been uh, completely clear and could be improved in the future. Uh, also, uh, when you have requests about additional information, you should react in a structured way and uh, prepare the, everything as requested by the panel. Because uh, also as a reviewer myself, I have uh, faced different uh, cases, both a case where uh, the information is uh, structured uh, in the same way as requested, point one, uh, the answer, point two, the answer, and also in a way where you get a folder of all the different documents which are not uh, arranged in any way. Uh, so you should uh, choose the first way to act. Uh, and also, uh, this, this request about additional information um, can help you yourself to identify what was not clear in your system and what might not uh, be so understandable and what should be clarified for yourself internally and what might be revised in order to be uh, clear, structured, and uh, functional. Okay, so this is from my side. Thank you, Asnate. Uh, well, what I, uh, what I need to thank you, uh, first of all, for um, this concrete example of how the self-assessment was done in, in the case of your agency. But then again, what I really liked uh, is how you put in the uh, put process in, in the context of collaborating with your stakeholders, the political context uh, poly of um, 
how you collaborated with policymakers and so on. Um, so I think this was really a, a valuable uh, input into how it was done in practice. Now, uh, before uh, we um, get into questions, I see that there is quite some uh, um, discussion going on in the chat uh, uh, function, uh, which is great. Uh, but uh, let me just uh, use a couple of minutes to uh, to um, to summarize some of the experience we have uh, in the Secretariat when scrutinizing uh, self-assessment reports that we receive for ANCA agency reviews. I try to um, make make a summary of and um, a summary of points, um, and then you can use these slides also uh, in in your own work um, later uh, in case you are. Um, um, in the process of uh, an ANCA agency review. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about um, uh, the self-assessment as such. So um, as you know, most of you um, know, um, it is part of uh, an ANCA agency review process um, that is then um, uh, used for membership uh, decision in ANCA and also other purposes such as registry on ACAR. Um, the criteria uh, against which uh, also the self-assessment report is written, um, the biggest chunk of it uh, are the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area. Now, why am I mentioning this uh, only here? Um, the thing is that um, I receive uh, questions on why uh, a big part of, of, um, of our self-assessment is, is focused on the standards and guidelines, but uh, so, I would like to emphasize that it is an exercise on compliance against the ESG. And is, in this sense, um, it needs to be the biggest part, obviously. Um, but then again, there are parts of uh, your self-assessment report where you can elaborate on your um, future challenges, uh, existing matters you're working on. Um, you can provide, a, you should provide the SWOT analysis. And then in this sense, you can really uh, uh, be sure that um, you have uh, encompassed the entire um, uh, functioning, functioning of your agency in, in the self-assessment process and the report as such. Um, I already mentioned at the beginning uh, that the self-assessment report should not be a goal in itself. Um, Fiona also mentioned it, that it's, it is one of the most valuable um, parts of um, of the review as we hear it from our members and, and well, agencies that undergone that have undergone our review um, next to obviously becoming a member of ANQA or using the report successfully for the registry on ECAR. Um, I still want to emphasize that um, the self-assessment as such is a really nice opportunity uh, for an agency to to make a stop in what uh, you're doing and uh, um, use some time to reflect on what works well, what could be improved, uh, who should we talk to that we usually don't have time to talk to uh, and to reflect on our work. Um, but then again, um, this exercise um, should be strategically positioned in, um, uh, in the rest of the work of the agency. So um, what I hear often and in, in we hear at the Secretariat is that um, the agencies um, tend to use such uh, activity um, for purposes apart from ANCA agency review whenever this is possible. And in this sense, um, you use the such um, extensive um, resources used for self-assessment um, also for other purposes, such as for rewriting the agency's strategy for the, let's say, next five years, or uh, reporting to the government. And in this sense, really making uh, the best out of your um, resources put into the self-assessment. Um, I have listed here um, contributing factors to the quality of the self-assessment self report as I see it uh, through the uh, scrutinies I make uh, in my uh, working time. Um, as not end, uh, um, Fiona already uh, elaborated on stakeholder involvement, commitment, teamwork, uh, communication, 
um, I would still emphasize a bit um, more uh, openness of, of such document um, as um, it is of a huge value if, if, if an agency um, puts some more effort into being self-critical, uh, into um, opening itself up to the panel, because only then um, um, the review will um, target with its recommendations and suggestions, things you would like to read actually uh, in your report. Uh, at the end of the day, this is what uh, matters. Um, then data quality is something that um, I would like to emphasize here as well. Uh, there is a, a section on um, stakeholders uh, feedback. Uh, I will elaborate on that in a second. But already here, let me point out that um, the way you collect um, evidence for for your statements and um, present data, uh, let's say from stakeholders involvement, it matters because uh, the more clearly it, it is presented, uh, the easier it is for the panel to understand uh, what are you trying to say and what stakeholders think of um, um, the collaboration with the agency. Um, some general remarks in this slide. Um, from what we see, it is good to assign a team, the team responsible for the process. But then again, it is not only, let's say, five, six people that are um, assigned to the, to the task to actually work on it solely, but to engage a wide range of stakeholders. That was my second point here in the slide. Um, Agree very clearly on the timeline. Uh, we try to do this from the very beginning when you uh, draft the terms of reference uh, with the secretariat. Still, um, sometimes it happens that then we do not manage to get the self-assessment report in time. So uh, a clear indication of who is contributing to what, when uh, is, is of a uh, big value. Um, Fiona already mentioned that um, enough time should be reserved for writing and editing. Um, Asnate, um, you explained um, how the process itself took more than two years even, um, taking into account uh, wild cons um, very wide consultations with the stakeholders. Um, I would like to emphasize one more thing here. Um, we, we see that um, good self-assessment reports um, look backward and forward. So in this in this regard, you see this um, um, development of thinking uh, of the agency on a specific matter, how they um, re um, reacted on, on the challenges they, are, they were or they are facing. And, and this is of, of uh, big value to the panel uh, and the board then uh, when making the decision on compliance. So basically how the agency is uh, trying to address um, uh, or how it is developing uh, through addressing the ESG uh, standards. Um, one very general comment is we, we would invite you to, to follow the structure of ANCA agency reviews guidelines uh, when, when, when drafting the self-assessment report as such. Um, there's a very simple um, reason behind um, providing you with, with the structure uh, of the self-assessment report, even though that it might be limiting in a way. Um, it is simply because um, the panels and our experts then know um, where to search for a specific information. In this regard, it, it facilitates the process. This goes then as well for the board, who is familiarized with, with the structure of the report in case they would like to dig even further in, into the... Um, specific statements of the re, uh, review panel in the report as such, uh, go and check into the SAR, how uh, the agency explained it, and so on. Um, in this uh, webinar, we already elaborated on, on the need for being critical, but not overcritical, um, being analytical, obviously. Um, so here I wrote minimum description, but maximum analysis in, in, in a bit playing with the word, but uh, uh, you see my point, um, the, as the report should not be overly um, um, exhaustive in, in the very specifics of the agency, but rather um, um, rather analytical in, in what you're trying to say. And then the dissemination part, um, 
we see that the good self-assessment reports are um, well distributed and uh, and inform the stakeholders of the agency of what is going on, as well as um, they are used for agencies' future activities, such as um, introducing new co-workers to, to the agency and so on. I, I mentioned um, the annex of the of our guidelines for NK agency review, so page 37 of this pink book. Um, I talked about uh, being concise. Uh, you know that we mentioned that there should be up to 10 uh, up to 10 annexes um, and then I, I would ex I would receive usually emails asking they could be 12 uh, or um, if then um, the agency should not include hyper hyperlinks uh, in the in the footnotes and so on. Uh, we invite you to include these hyperlinks in the documents that are available online, simply because then the panel would uh, more easily locate um, um, to to what documents um, the statements in the report refer to. Um, this doesn't mean that the uh, report should not be self-standing, uh, quite the opposite. Um, Usually what I hear from uh, the agencies is that when whenever they give uh, the self-assessment report to someone completely external to read it, and if that person understands uh, what the agency is trying to say, then the report is, uh, is good enough. Uh, sometimes it can be um, external members of the board, like in the case of uh, QA, as we heard. Sometimes um, it is the stakeholders that read the the final draft or or one of the final drafts of the of the SAR and then uh, if they understand uh, what is uh, trying to be said and reflected on in the report then the report is um, good to go. Um, I said it should not be lengthy but still uh, it is important that each quality assurance activity as stated in our terms of reference should be addressed individually uh, under the standards of part two uh, still, it happens quite often that uh, this is not the case, so I, I rather emphasize it here once again. Um, you should not um, rank your activities in the sense that since we are working mostly on institutional evaluations, we will not explain, um, let's say, uh, cross-border quality assurance in, in the same uh, length or in the same detail. Uh, the panel should be able to understand what is going uh, on with each of the activities um, and related to each of the standards of uh, ESG part two. Um, the same goes for the ECAR, ECARS eligibility confirmation. Um, so make sure that uh, you check the document as well. Um, now, uh, I listed here also a summary table explaining the number of activities per year per activity. Uh, usually the panels would um, then ask in, in after receiving the SAR to provide such a table to the panel. So um, in this sense, it is better to uh, count your activities uh, already before you, um, before you uh, submit the SAR. Couple of uh, points on the background of the process. Um, the panel that is obviously reading uh, the, the report should understand um, um, how the, the self-assessment report was developed, how it was created, um, what means were used to, uh, for the, uh, from, uh, by the agency to reflect on its work. It is not a, um, a simple chapter on a couple of um, uh, factual data on when, when the um, uh, self-assessment group met and, and that's it. Rather, um, you, you, you should... Um, put some effort in explaining how it was developed, uh, what was uh, used, how, how the agency managed to, um, let's say, use this report for, um, not only for AK agency reviews, but in case it were used also for other uh, purposes, that should be clearly stated there as well. Um, I've not already talked about the terminology, so here I will not um, point it here uh, once again. Um, but I would like to um, emphasize once again the self-standing and self-explanatory nature of uh, such a document. I need to um, use some time to um, to um, to point out the mapping grid that should be part of the ESG 2.1. Basically, 
our expectation is that the report you are providing um, would discuss how the different standards uh, of the ESG part one uh, are reflected in your uh, in the criteria of your agency's um, activities. So simply you would put columns in columns, you would put activities and then ESG uh, part one standards as rows and then make this uh, crosscut of, um, in order to provide the panel with information of how you address ESG part one. Um, now, some I tried to um, point out some specific specificities of the standards as well. In 2.7, we see that complaints and appeals are not explained separately. So in this sense, it is good to do that from the very beginning. Uh, and for resources, a very small note here, um, that obviously next to the reflection in, in all other uh, ESGs, also here, um, the panel uh, values uh, very much um, the agency's reflection on, on, its, uh, on its resources. It is not enough to state, let's say, how, how many staff members are working on specific activity or so, but rather to be uh, uh, critical, self-critical, um, reflective on uh, what is the situation at the agency and how you're using the resources and uh, um, how do you connect these resources to, let's say, uh, future challenges and uh, things mentioned in the SWOT analysis. Um, we talked about the stakeholders' opinion. Um, it is good to not only mention the agency's collaboration with different stakeholders in, in a very descriptive way, but rather um, elaborate very briefly on, on the actual feedback you got from them, uh, from including them in the, let's say, last year. Uh, what, what is their opinion of, of the agency's uh, work uh, with higher education institutions? Um, and then you can add this summary in, in an annex or, or elaborate on it um, in any other way. Um, this is about um, our experience from uh, scrutinizing the self-assessment um, reports. Um, we are we are left with three minutes. Uh, times really go. Time really goes fast. <laughs> um, so uh, perhaps um, a question or two that I uh, noticed um, in the chat function. Um, there were there was a question on how to find the uh, time uh, when in for such time consuming um, consuming process and the second one perhaps on um, on how to address the um, fresh paint so basically when an agency is um, uh, redeveloping its, its methodology you know, whether the agency should be honest or or what how should how should such um, um, development of an agency be addressed in the report. So perhaps on this second matter, um, I know that Fiona, you already uh, written it down, uh, but for, perhaps for uh, the rest of the um, attendees, just to once again uh, point it out, the, the points you would like to uh, raise. Okay, um, on, on fresh paint, uh, yes. a couple of key points. One is that panels will always know that an agency is never fixed in time things are always changing for agencies. We, we, don't, we don't decide on something and then do it for 10 years. There are many external forces like uh, politics, ministries change, um, heads of agencies change and have different ideas. Um, so, so things are never fixed. So fresh paint, fresh paint to a certain extent is, is always going to be something that a review panel will have to deal with, as will the agency in terms of explaining that in its self-assessment. I think there are two different kinds of fresh paint. One is fresh paint where someone has suddenly thought, oh, oh, we, we don't do that and we're meant to quick. Somebody just write a quick policy um, and we'll print it off. And we would say in England quite often that, that the, the ink isn't dry. And that's basically that, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you've printed the policy so quickly and sort of so soon before the, the panel arrives that the ink isn't even dry on the paper. That is the kind of fresh paint that I don't think a review panel would be happy to deal with. Mm. The kind of fresh paint that they would be sort of more accepting of, I think, is where something has changed very recently, but that they can track back why the change happened, um, where the kind of discussions were around development and implementation of the change. And those discussions are likely to have happened a few months before the very new thing that is actually happening. 
So I think if something is clearly being done just for the sake of the review and there's nothing to back it up, then I don't think a review panel would look on that particularly leniently. But other innovations and changes to methodologies and changes to the way you do things where there can be where it's clear that there has been a reason for that and some discussions around how and why that's going to happen. I think that's the kind of fresh paint that we all deal with on on a well, it feels like sometimes a daily basis, but I'm sure it's not quite as often as that. Thank you very much, Fiona, for this. Um, um, indeed, I think it, it clarifies uh, uh, a lot uh, how to um, how to properly address uh, these matters uh, in, in a fair way in, in the self assessment report. Um, and any uh, we ran out of the, of time, but um, let me still invite you if you uh, to to express any uh, final thoughts, if you have any, Asnata or Fiona? Um, Asnata, I'll let oh. you go. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot fear, uh, hear you, Asnata, but uh, I, from from your facial expression, it was there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, last uh, thought on the matter. In, in this case, um, I would like to thank you both for your contribution to this webinar. I, I hope you found you found it um, interesting, and uh, thank you all um, the participants for your um, for your time. And um, have a nice. What else to say then? Have a nice rest of uh, the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Goran. Thank you to participants. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye.